History as it happens, September 16th, 2021. Paging General Washington. Despite America having unprecedented and successful vaccination program, despite the fact that for almost five months, free vaccines have been available in 80,000 different locations, we still have nearly 80 million Americans who have failed to get the shot. As summer changes to fall, more than 1,000 Americans are dying every day from COVID-19, almost all of them unvaccinated. Many of the recalcitrant say forcing them to get a shot violates their personal liberty. It's hard to enjoy freedom if you're dead, but resistance to vaccination is as old as vaccines, although mandates work. George Washington would agree. That's next as we report History as it Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. When is the time? When do Americans get their freedom back? When we get the level of infection in this country low enough. When you have a president like Biden issuing unconstitutional edicts against the American people, uh, we have We've been patient, to stand up for- but our patience is wearing thin. And your refusal has cost all of us. So please do the right thing. Since early June, about three and a half months ago, close to 12,000 Floridians have died of COVID-19. That state is one of the hottest hot spots in a country that has more available vaccine doses than people, but where some 80 million eligible people have yet to get the shot. So that is why President Biden is proposing mandatory vaccinations now, eliciting a predictable response from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. This order would result potentially in millions of Americans losing their jobs. I think we should be protecting people's jobs, not trying to kick people out of work right now. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in Florida. Now, we need to mention that DeSantis does encourage vaccination. He opposes mandates for masks and so-called vaccine passports, too. Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan tweeted vaccine mandates are un-American. Now, that would be news to one George Washington. As many commenters pointed out to Jordan, General Washington required inoculations for smallpox to save his army during the Revolutionary War. Yeah, so George Washington, he acquired smallpox early in his life, and he saw 30 to 40 percent of people who get it die. And so he was lucky enough to survive. His contemporaries had also seen the ravages of smallpox. Uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote an opening kind of editorial for a pamphlet advocating for inoculation. This is before the smallpox vaccine. And that is Dr. Rene Nehera, the editor of the History of Vaccines blog for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. He's going to join us in a moment to discuss how we got to this strange place in America. What we might call the modern anti-vax movement began in the 1960s when a series of vaccines were developed to prevent measles, mumps, and rubella. This was the decade after the first polio vaccine was greeted with enthusiasm. Authorizes its release, the polio vaccine can begin to protect American youngsters. In 1955, over 10 million children received one or more injections of self-vaccine, including this boy, the president's own grandson, David Eisenhower. And now, like millions of boys and girls across the nation... A 1956 film promoting the polio vaccine via C-SPAN. Free to play and enjoy the delights of summertime. Before we speak to the doctor, we're going to say hi to the Washington Times politics reporter Thomas Howell. He covers all things COVID for the newspaper. We're going to get the particulars about Biden's mandate plan. Thomas Howell, welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's begin with President Biden's, the nuts and bolts of President Biden's vaccine mandate plan. Uh, Why did the administration feel that it needed to go ahead with this after candidate Biden had said he would oppose mandates? Yeah, I think they're starting to feel like they're kind of stuck. For those of us who follow the needle when it comes to that percentage, that CDC dashboard of what percent of the U.S. population is vaccinated, It's been kind of tethered to around 50%, just over 50%, about 54. And it's moving very slowly. And at the same time, officials are very worried about the winter, about this Delta variant that's already wreaking havoc across the country. What's around the corner? We have this vaccine. It's supposed to be our way out. Some people aren't taking it 
And it's a big question of whether we're going to see another winter spike just like last year, even though we have this tool. So it's reflecting that urgency and it's reflecting, and he said it over and over, that a majority of Americans are now vaccinated and it's a minority who are not. So he's really leaning into that, thinking he has the public on his side. You know, there's going to be backlash, but he seems to think that majority is important and the public will back him in this. Vaccine mandates are the norm, have been the norm. They do work. About 80 million Americans, according to the president, are eligible for a vaccination but haven't received it yet. Of course, children under 12 not eligible yet. What is the percentage the administration believes is realistic to attain? Because we're not going to get to 100 Mm percent, right? And probably 90 percent is unrealistic. What are they hoping for? It changes a lot. Early in the pandemic, they had pinpointed a floor of at least 70 percent. Now we're hearing with Delta variant. They're looking more at 90%. Categorically, you can't really reach that without the children getting it. We'll see how this mandate procedure plays out with the backlash. Courts are going to get involved. But I think they're trying to give employers who want to do this some cover, saying, look, the government's saying we have to do this. Let's just do it. Just just go get the shot, okay? The idea of herd immunity has been very elusive. And Fauci and others have basically said, we'll know it when we see it, you know, more people get vaccinated, the numbers should come down and we'll get more and more comfortable. So it's kind of a, a spectrum. Uh, John Barry, the great historian of the 1918 flu pandemic, who's been on this podcast a couple of times, has said that herd immunity may never happen if the virus continues to mutate. Let's get into some of the particulars of the Biden plan. Companies with a certain number of workers, minimum number of workers, have to require vaccination, right? Yeah, but there's also an important part that those who refuse can also be mandated to just submit to weekly testing. That's been overshadowed a bit because people hear, oh, you're forcing someone to get a shot. People focus on that. But there is a weekly testing option. However, the power, as envisioned, the power is with the employer to say what they want. They could say, no, you have to get the shot and that's it. The White House suggested that if they do allow weekly testing, the company will have to pick up the tab. So that could be an important part of their calculus. It's almost as if they're squeezing them into, hey, we would prefer you to have a full vaccine requirement. And it's companies with at least 100 employees. And the administration's going to do this through OSHA, right? Yes. OSHA has a long history of requiring certain things for workplace safety. Typically, though, that's things like filtration systems, earmuffs that allow work site, things like that. This is kind of uncharted territory because we're talking about going out outside the workplace and get a a needle stuck in your arm. And it's a new vaccine. So that's where some of the pushback is. Well, that's where a lot of the pushback is saying this isn't your typical OSHA enforcement. And the president's tone seems to have grown sharper. He basically said, we're running out of patience, right? Mm -hmm. As I was saying before, he really leaned into that. You're a vocal minority and you're about a quarter of the population that's causing the rest of us a problem. You know, the White House has been more clear about the fact that the vaccines were developed under the Trump administration, and now they're carrying it out. So they're kind of throwing it back at the public saying, you know, what do you want? Everyone knows this is the main tool, the main vehicle. So it's time to relent and go get it. But vaccine mandates, as I mentioned, have always been the norm. I mean, they're currently the norm for school children, international travel, the U.S. military. In your view, is the administration on solid legal ground here? The experts I talk to say that that they are. It's just that there's all these little mechanisms in here where, you know, it's the government saying you have to do it, but it's also still within the purview of the employer. And like I said before, it's kind of an odd application of OSHA power. So some people think a judge somewhere is going to block it and it might get messy with injunctions. You know how that goes. I'm sure DUP governors know which courts to file their lawsuits in where they might have a better shot of tripping this thing up. So yes, I think they do have a lot of latitude. It's just in particular, so this might get tripped up somewhere. All right, Thomas Howell of the Washington Times. We thank you for the information. Now let's move on to our conversation with Dr. Renee Nahara, an epidemiologist and editor of the History of Vaccines blog for the College of Physicians. 
He headed the outbreak response teams that led investigations into long-term care facilities, nursing homes, schools, and businesses in Fairfax County, Virginia, that is a suburb of Washington, D.C. He helped those places keep their residents, keep their customers safe, and keep them open for business. Dr. Nehera, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. So, Dr. Nehera, why don't we start by having you explain what you do for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, which was established in the late 18th century. You're the editor of a blog there, which can be found at historyofvaccines.org. It's an educational resource. The college is actually not a university, so why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so back in the late 1700s, as people may know, the, the country was quite young, trying to get itself organized. And a group of physicians in the Philadelphia area, they got together and founded the college. It's called the College of Physicians because it was a group of colleagues getting together. It's not the, the college definition by, by today's standards. And they've been working on advancing medicine, advancing collegiality between physicians and the community. And some of those things, you know, just blossomed from there, like the History of Vaccines website that in the digital age, try to put the History of Vaccines available to the world. The college also has a Mutter Museum, which is a museum of medical oddities. If you're ever in the Philadelphia area, drop in and take a look. Some very interesting medical cases are showcased there. And then also the Historical Medical Library. It's a library full of books, some of them going back centuries, that different fellows collected in their travels around the world and donated to the Historical Medical Library. We have letters even from George Washington ordering his generals to move troops around Philadelphia, but not to go into Philadelphia because there is a, a smallpox outbreak during the Revolutionary War. First, before we talk about smallpox in the late 18th century and George Washington, I do want to get your thoughts on this current moment. President Biden unveiled his vaccine mandate program It was something that at least it appeared at first he wanted to avoid, but too many Americans are still unvaccinated, and Mm -hmm. every day a thousand or more Americans are dying as we record this podcast. Almost all of these deaths are preventable because almost all of the people dying are unvaccinated. What are your thoughts, given the history of this subject, what are your thoughts on why Americans are resisting this vaccine? You know, you you go back through the history from the first vaccination onward, and even before the first vaccine, there was this procedure called inoculation, where you gave somebody smallpox in a controlled setting under the supervision of a physician, and they would develop smallpox, but it would be a very mild case of it compared to the the full-blown smallpox that would kill you. Even then, there was resistance. The first person to suggest uh, publicly that that should be done in what was in the American colonies was a reverend by the name of Cotton Mather up in Massachusetts. He got together with some physicians after getting information from one of his slaves that this procedure worked and it kept the slaves free from smallpox. And upon suggesting it, his house was firebombed. There were protests against him. Uh, He was deemed to be crazy. How dare you try to bring this voodoo, this witchcraft to us? A lot of incredulity. And it just goes on from there. The first vaccine in the late 1700s against smallpox gets developed. And Edward Jenner, the British physician who developed it, gets a lot of hate mail. (laughs) Every single vaccine since then has had some measure of opposition. And so this is nothing nothing new. In fact, when the pandemic started, we kind of knew that that was going to be the case. So, doctor, why then, in your view, are so many Americans unvaccinated today? There are a number of possible explanations It's politics, it's complacency, lack of solid information, laziness. What are your views on Americans today? So I I classify them into four different groups. The first group are the ones who are dubious about the vaccine. They are fully vaccinated for other diseases. They fully vaccinate their children for other diseases. But then this vaccine comes around and to their eyes, it happens to be turned around in about a year's time. And it just seems a little bit too fast, a little bit too good. And so they're, they're skeptical about it. Many of them have changed their mind upon seeing the data and upon seeing their friends and family get vaccinated and nothing, happened, nothing bad happened to them from the vaccine. And upon seeing that 98, 99% of the people who are now with a Delta variant hospitalized or dying who are not vaccinated. And so they see that and they change their mind. The second subset are the people who are anti-vaccine because they don't feel that they need it. They feel healthy. They feel like they could withstand anything. These are the younger folks. These are the folks who tend to eat more naturally. They tend to follow exercise gurus, advice, et cetera. And it's not that they don't know better. They're actually very well educated and they understand biology, but they just, they don't feel that they need it. 
they don't feel that they need it to the point that they actually turn against vaccinations and they turn against what they call allopathic medicine, which is regular medicine. So they're against all vaccinations in general, yeah, not just yeah. this one. And then you have the folks who, who don't know better. They don't know any better because they just, who pays attention to biology class in high school, right? Or when they went to college, if they went to college, they didn't take a biology course. So they don't understand the biology of what's going on. And when they seek out answers in social media, Google, Facebook, et cetera, they tend to go towards the biased results for whatever reason. Either their circle of friends is one that is uninformed. It's not that they're anti-vaccine. It's just that they don't know any better. They don't know, for example, ivermectin is a medicine for parasites and a parasite is not a virus. They don't know what phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials are. They just, you know, they don't have that information. So they go with the quickest information that they can get and that's where they get it. So they're taking in unreliable, inaccurate information and they're assuming mm -hmm. that it's correct. Yeah. Yeah. If you remember before social media, if it was printed in the newspaper, it was assumed to be legit, right? There's an editorial process and somebody's double checking the facts. And so that must be good information. Now in the era of social media, we have an official looking website with a good sounding name. And you think that it's got a good editorial board with, with ethics and standards and, and it doesn't. And they, they take that information as being legitimate. It's not that they want to, it's just that that's the information that is available to them because of the bubble that they've constructed around themselves socially in this era of social media. And then you have the fourth kind, I call them the showmen. They are the people who spread anti-vaccine information. They know that it is misinformation, but they're making a buck out of it. And that's, that's what matters. They themselves may or may not be vaccinated, but they will sell you supplements to counteract the quote unquote side effects of vaccination. If you already got vaccinated, or they'll send you nutritional supplements to counteract the infection should you get it. You know, <laughs> they're the, the frustrating ones because they, they do know better. They, uh, in some instances, have admitted to knowing better, but they say, you know, if there's a market for it. I'm providing a service that people are looking for. So vaccine resistance goes across the political spectrum on the left and the right. Uh, right now, people on the right, whether they're conservatives, Trump supporters, whoever, are being criticized for, and there have been many high profile cases, for instance, of conservative radio hosts who spread misinformation or derided the vaccine, and they're now dead. This cohort of Americans is being criticized for perpetuating the pandemic, uh, whether that's fair or not. There are people out there who just simply do not want to get the vaccine because they still do not take the coronavirus seriously. They also oppose wearing masks. They also oppose business restrictions to prevent the spread of the virus. They believe this is an infringement on their personal freedom. Uh, what is your take on that? When you think about it in the abstract, right, we live in a country that has always put freedom and uh, liberty above everything else. It's, it's everywhere. It's ingrained in the culture. It's in the history. And we often talk about our rights, the Bill of Rights, our rights under the Constitution, our human rights, et cetera. And the, the idea of our responsibilities kind of gets lost in all that. It's a very American way of thinking that I don't want the government to tell me what to do, you know, so long as I'm not hurting anybody else. But you're very capable of transmitting the, the virus to, to other people. And so, yes, if you are not vaccinated, you're increasing the chances that you're going to actually hurt somebody else. We also don't live in a bubble. If you end up in the hospital, there's a good chance that my tax dollars are going to go towards your care through the Medicaid or Medicare system. There's a limited ability to see, and it happens on, on both sides. Yes, we're criticizing people on the right, but I think it's because they've been the more outwardly spoken about mandates, mass mandates, vaccine mandates, et cetera. And then, like you said, some conservative radio hosts, they end up dying. And so you you kind of have that impression of that they're the ones who uh, are the ones resisting and dying. But I can tell you for sure that people on the left are also resisting this on the basis of, I want to be healthy. I don't want to, I don't want to have anything unhealthy inside of me. And then also a measure of, I don't want the government to put things in my body that I don't want. Uh, there's also that there. So it's, it happens on both ends of the political spectrum. It's just that we are seeing the effects in the ones who happen to have a radio show and happen to be outspoken. And then this happens to them. If you want to play the what if game, what if President Trump wins re-election? How does the left relate to the vaccine? Do they see it as one of his accomplishments and then refuse it because, you know, they want to go against him? Kamala Harris took some criticism for a comment she made during a debate last year. If the Trump administration approves a vaccine before or after the election, should Americans take it and would you take it? If the public health professionals, if Dr. Fauci, if the doctors 
tell us that we should take it, I'll be the first in line to take it. Absolutely. But if Donald Trump tells us I should t- that we should take it, I'm not taking it. So let's go back to George Washington. Uh, recently, the Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan, a Republican, made a statement on social media that vaccine mandates are un-American. And of course, people immediately pounced on that comment, pointing out that when Washington was in charge of the Continental Army, he mandated smallpox inoculations because he could see the devastating effect of that dreaded disease on his army. Yeah, so George Washington, um, he he acquired smallpox early in his life, and he saw 30 to 40 percent of people who get it die. And so he was lucky enough to survive. His contemporaries had also seen the ravages of smallpox. Uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote an opening kind of editorial for a pamphlet advocating for inoculation. This is before the smallpox vaccine. So the Revolutionary War starts, and George Washington notices that as British troops are, arrive, they're bringing smallpox with them, and there's outbreaks going on. And it leads to the loss at the Battle of Quebec. His troops lose the battle in part because they are ravaged by smallpox. And so he sees the Native Americans also get ravaged by it, and he sees that the British are the ones that are bringing it over. The British have an almost never-ending supply of men to keep bringing over, so he, he notices that it's going to keep happening. So he might as well just get on with it in order that every new recruit get inoculated and every existing soldier get inoculated as soon as possible. But he mostly focused on the new recruits because they were easy to do as part of their intake into the army. You stay in, in bed a couple of days after getting the inoculation. But in some cases, there are documented cases where men had to be forcibly held down to be given the, the smallpox inoculation. You think of this this fight for freedom, fight for liberty from a tyrannical government, and it involved authoritarian measures to get everybody inoculated to ensure that the army would be safe to, so they can carry out the campaign. And we have some of those letters, like I mentioned, from the generals to George Washington, and he instructs them to stay out of, out of Philadelphia because there was a smallpox epidemic happening, and to also make sure that all the men were inoculated or in the process of being inoculated as soon as possible because they were going, they were on their way north and they were going to be facing the British troops again in New York. And every president since, <laughs> with very few exceptions, ordered some sort of public health intervention on the army, on the Navy, on the Marines. Good point, because one of the themes of this episode is vaccine mandates have always been the norm. Uh, going back to George Washington, that was inoculation. And then after vaccination became commonplace today, children have to be vaccinated against a host of diseases before going to school. Members of the U.S. military are vaccinated. People who want to travel internationally to certain parts of the world. Uh, When did the modern anti-vaccination movement begin? It's the 1960s, right? Because the polio vaccine was not resisted in the 1950s. But then after other vaccinations are developed in succession in the 1960s, isn't that when we start to see what we would call a modern anti-vaccination movement? Yeah, it, it, it begins in the 60s with the polio vaccine because polio is not seen as much anymore. And so the anti-vaccine groups begin saying things like, well, it's not a threat anymore. Why are you vaccinating my child? Which is a counterproductive argument, right? You stop vaccination, it's going to come back. And then in then the 70s as well, you know, especially groups out of Europe start exporting their ideas to the U.S., but then it really it really takes up in the 80s. In the 80s, there was a documentary on a t- television show out of Washington, D.C., and it was called Vaccine Roulette. For more than a year, we have been investigating the P, the pertussis port of the vaccine. What we have found are serious questions about the safety and effectiveness of the shot. It had a, a component in it. It was uh, the whole cell, so the whole microbe that caused pertussis, uh, which is whooping cough was included in the vaccine and it had a very high level of reaction in children. So they got their vaccine and many of them would get a fever. Many of them would get some side effect from the vaccine. In a small number of cases, it would get really bad. And some children were in fact injured by that vaccine. And this documentary vaccine roulette kind of exaggerated the numbers, kind of made it sound like the vaccine was A, not needed and B, dangerous if you did get it. What happened from that was the the Childhood Vaccination Act basically created a fund to reimburse monetarily families who were affected from a vaccine side effect because vaccine manufacturers looked at public sentiment and they almost pulled out of making vaccines altogether because they, they felt like they were going to be sued into oblivion. And so the Vaccine Act creates this fund. It also creates a special set of courts where parents who want to sue vaccine manufacturers have to go through this court system first. And all they have to show is is 50% and a feather 
of evidence that the vaccine caused their bad outcome. All the court costs and the lawyer fees were paid by this fund. If they didn't like the outcome of that particular trial, they could go to regular court afterward. And so then the 1990s come along, uh, late 1990s, a British physician by the name of Andrew Wakefield, he is given money by some lawyers in England who want to sue the manufacturer of the MMR vaccine in England. And they give him money and they say, can you find something for us that we can hinge our lawsuit on? And he commits scientific fraud in his study trying to link the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, to autism. The paper has been retracted because it was fraudulent, but even in the conclusion of the paper, the authors do state that there is no link between the MMR vaccine and autism. However, Mr. Wakefield did decide to have a press conference and a very, a very widely attended press conference, and he said that it was his gut feeling that the vaccine did cause autism. And he became the darling of anti-vaccine movements uh, around the world, but primarily in the U.S. He moved to Texas. He started the, the speaking circuit with anti-vaccine groups, and everybody said, look, here's this physician. He's done research. He knows what he's talking about, and he agrees with us that the MMO vaccine causes autism. And so that is the birth of the very modern era of the Jenny McCarthy's and the celebrity anti-vaccine people. That's right. Jenny McCarthy went on Oprah to talk about it. And you're right. These people are frauds. And I want to return to that subject in a moment. But let's go back to the polio vaccine. I want to clarify something you said before. When it was released, the first polio vaccine in 1954, it was greeted with enthusiasm. There was no real resistance to it. But it was in the 1960s when more vaccines for different diseases were developed that people started to push back, right? Yeah, but a couple of things happened with the polio vaccine. So it gets licensed and the trials happened in 1954. It gets licensed in 1955 and it starts being given widely. Only a handful of laboratories in the, in the country were producing the vaccine. And regulation then wasn't what regulation is now. The FDA was in its infancy. There was no real real-time sharing of data. The Cutter Laboratories out west, they created a batch of the vaccine where they didn't quite kill the polio virus. And they ended up giving polio to a, a few hundred children. And out of those few hundred children who got polio, a handful died. And it was a big hit to the polio vaccine. You see the vaccine rates go down after that. But luckily, the Sabin vaccine, which is a, an oral vaccine for polio, comes in and, and fills up that void saying, yeah, look, we have another polio vaccine. We've done the trials. It's safe. And so people started taking that. And as these two vaccines combined in the United States, the rates of polio really, really dropped. Again, it's the people who don't know, know better, right? They don't know biology. They don't know epidemiology, virology. And they see that there's no more polio. There's no more kids on iron lungs. So why do we need the vaccine? They don't understand they can come back from any part of the world back to the U.S. I believe that's called confusing cause and effect. And thank you, doctor, for clarifying the information about the polio vaccine in the 1950s. So back to our current moment. I suppose it would have been foolish to expect 100 percent adult vaccination rate by now in our country because uh, you can't get 100 percent of anything. Right. Ninety uh, percent probably also unrealistic. What is a realistic goal, an endpoint for our country, given everything we've been discussing? Gosh, that is a that is a hundred thousand dollar question. I think I would be I would be leading the CDC if I knew the, the precise answer to that, right? And yes, like you say, hundred percent totally foolish to think of that. It's called the Nirvana fallacy, where you want if it's not a hundred percent, it's not no good. I think we have shifted the goals all around what would be community immunity or herd immunity. It was 60% and 70%. It's probably closer to 70% than 60, probably closer to 70% than 80%. So we're, we're in a good spot at the na national level. However, what is a community changes, right? So a, a community in the South, for example, might only have 30% vaccinated. So they're not at, at herd immunity levels. A community in the North or, or in the, a big city in a building could be 100% vaccinated and their herd immunity is, is great. But they also live with other people coming in and out. So it kind of erodes it a little bit. That's kind of the, the focus on these proportions of uh, wanting to have, you know, 70% of adults vaccinated, 70% of the whole population vaccinated. I think a realistic goal would be 80%. So you punch through the community immunity and then you get to this level where, well, it's 80%. That's going to put a lot of pressure off of hospitals from lower hospitalizations, et cetera, for the next wave. But you also have to understand that this is a population that children under 12 are not 
being able to be vaccinated right now. And they make up a, a sizable proportion of our population. So until that happens, we're not going to be anywhere near herd immunity as a nation. And until mentality changes in, in the different parts of the country, there are going to be communities that are not going to be near herd immunity. And so in those communities, the healthcare systems are going to be seeing the effects of this. So I don't know when that'll happen. I, I think it will happen. It's just a, a matter of when. For example, the flu vaccine. The flu vaccine, people always say something like, oh, I don't get my flu shot because then I get the flu. Well, we know that's not true. You get you get flu-like symptoms at times, but that's just your immune system reacting to the vaccine. And that's actually a, a good sign, right? But last year, 2020, was a, a record year. Uh, I think something like 255 million doses of the flu vaccine were given out. A very high uptake. You know, in survey after survey, you see that people who were skeptical of the COVID vaccine are not skeptical of the flu vaccine, and they went and got it. What did we see? Because of mass mandates and other things, we saw virtually no flu. It can happen. It's just a matter of changing, changing attitudes and changing perceptions on, on what you're opposing, in this case, the COVID-19 vaccines. So based on what we know from history, how do we get to those people who are still reluctant or recalcitrant? So we know from vaccine mandates that they work, and, and you've seen them work with the childhood immunizations. Very few places in the country have a lower than 90% coverage for the MMR vaccine, which is a vaccine that protects you against measles, for which herd immunity doesn't kick in until like 94, 95%. It's so infectious that it need, you need almost everybody to be vaccinated. California recently, uh, in the last 10 years, they changed to a model where they didn't allow anything but medical exemptions to vaccination in children in schools. And when that happened, even parents who were very skeptical of the vaccine, even parents who didn't want and they had quote unquote philosophical reasons for not getting vaccinated, even they changed their, their tune and, and went and got the children vaccinated. Many of them reported that it was, you know, it's just easier to get the vaccine and get it over with than go through all the paperwork and, and the lawsuits and everything. A state like West Virginia, you know, a very conservative red state, they have never had philosophical or religious exemptions to vaccination. From the get-go, when they started mandating school vaccines, they've had no exemption except for a medical exemption. And they have very high rates of vaccination among, among their kids. In that sense, vaccine mandates do work. The other thing that we have seen working, and this is something from a, a series of conversations with different ethnic and social groups around the country that a study from Hopkins was led, people change their mind when people like them change their mind. So we tend to think of influencers as people who could influence a, a large group of people to change their mind about something, buy a product, et cetera. But all the influencers do is they plant the seeds in certain people in a, in a community. It's up to those people to spread the message or to spread that information. And so, for example, we had a, a large group of Latino residents, many of whom were very skeptical of the vaccine because of the history of medical experimentation in their native countries, because of fear of the government, because of distrust of the government. But once they started seeing that people in their own community, people who spoke Spanish like them, people who ate the same food, et cetera, were getting vaccinated and nothing, nothing happened to them, then they changed their mind. And so we do listen to celebrities. We do listen to authority, but nothing beats the good old uh, social pressure, close circle of friends. Uh, everybody says that they're vaccinated. You're more likely to, to follow along. The mandates are a good start, but these conversations with folks and spreading that message are also going to have to be done uh, more intensely and more personally. I noticed you didn't mention shaming and mocking as ways to persuade people to get vaccinated. No, they don't know. You know, because that's what you see on social yeah. media. Yeah, yeah. No, it may work on a very small, limited number of people. But they generally don't work. And they don't work because adults like to be treated like adults. And shaming and mocking is something that you do between children or between teenagers, right? That's right, Doc. Uh, social media does make kids out of adults. And that may be a good spot to wrap up here. It would be wise for our society to refrain from mocking and deriding people who are dying from a disease they refuse to believe was real or who refuse to get the vaccine for whatever reason, no matter how ignorant you think it is. Such feelings of ill will poison the self, do they not? On the next episode of History As It Happens, who was Osama bin Laden? We'll speak to one of the only Western journalists to have met bin Laden during a 1997 interview for CNN, the author of a new biography of the dead Al-Qaeda leader. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. 